people of God said, Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Philippians again. As we go through the book of Philippians, we are at chapter number 2. And I want to read verses 25 through verse number 30. Philippians at chapter 2, verses 25 through verse 30. And I want to talk about a profile of a Christian, a man by the name of Epaphroditus. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem because for the work of Christ he came close to death not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. A profile of a Christian, Epaphroditus. French philosopher by the name of Blaise Pascal put it perfectly. Blaise Pascal says, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. Listen to that again. There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. You can try to fill that vacuum with money. You can try to fill that vacuum with relationships. You can try to fill that vacuum with any costly thing you can imagine, but it's shaped in the form of God. And nothing in your heart will satisfy. No created thing will ever satisfy you but a relationship with God made known through Jesus Christ. As one reads the epistles of Paul the Apostle, it is apparent that he crossed paths with many different individuals. Some like Hymenaeus and Alexander the coppersmith it was seen were a great hindrance to the work of Paul. However, most of the people that Paul met were a great blessing to his ministry. Paul closes nearly every one of his letters with a personal note to some very special people that he had worked with, not only as a tent maker, but as a follower of Jesus Christ. When you read the last chapter of the book of Romans, Paul mentions some 35 names of people who had ministered with him and he would not close his letters without sending them greetings. This morning, Paul speaks about a man named Epaphroditus. From his name, it would appear that Epaphroditus was a Greek and a Gentile. His name means belonging to or being favored by Aphrodite. Aphrodite was the Greek goddess of love and the patron saint of gamblers. That's going to make sense to you in just a minute. The name Epaphroditus naturally or eventually came to mean lovely or charming. 
That's what Christians ought to be. Lovely and charming. A whole lot of Christians are not lovely and charming. Hard-hearted is a good word for some of us. Mean is a good word for some of us. Ugly acting is, might be another appellation for many of us. But if you're going to be the Christian God wants you to be, you ought to be lovely and charming. In these few precious verses, we are given a glimpse of a man who possessed certain characteristics that should be in every born-again believer. I want you to see in the text that Epaphroditus is first of all called by Paul a son which makes him balanced. That's what a son is. That's what a member of the family of God is, balanced. It is easy, listen to me, it is easy for Christians to get out of balance. Uh, that is, we are prone to focus on one area of our Christian walk to the exclusion of other areas that are just as important. Some of us are only concerned about fellowship. All you want to do is meet, eat, and greet. Uh, you want to be in your deacon family ministry, or you want to be in your particular circle of friends, or you want to be in your particular ministry that has your name on it and your brand on it, and all you think about is what you do to the exclusion of all else. And then there are some persons who are just concerned about evangelism. All they want to do is win the loss to the exclusion of spiritual growth and godly development. There's more to church than evangelizing. Because after you catch the fish, you got to clean them. Uh, after you go and get the lost, that's wonderful. That's what you ought to do. But then you ought not bring them in here if you don't have anything for them to do. Then some folk are just concerned about legalism. All they do is inspect other people's fruit. Uh, trying to find out what you're doing and where you've been and who you're going with and what's up in your life and what are you doing in your, what are you worry about your business. Uh, uh, sweep around your own front door. I wish I had two or three witnesses here. But when a Christian or a church gets out of balance, it brings reproach on the body of Christ. Uh, it's like a, a, a car that has a flat and you take the tire off and put that little tire that's in the trunk on the car. It, it, it still runs, but it's out of balance. Uh, it's not the right fit. It's not the right tire. It'll run for a while, but, but it's not the best design of the automobile. And when you are not balanced as a believer, when you are all this to the exclusion of all else, you're doing pretty good, but you're out of balance. Are y'all listening to me? Paul calls him my brother. That word brother in the text means my son. And because of their age difference, uh, Epaphroditus is not Paul's uh, fellow worker. He's not just a brother. Paul looks at him affectionately as a son. Both these terms refer to being members of the same family. Brothers and sisters, Lily Grove, we are in this work together. And we should love one another and stand together as brothers and sisters in Christ. There is no place in the Christian family for one brother to be attacking another brother. There's no place in the church for division and strife. John chapter 13 and verse number 35 says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. It's not about competing. It's about cooperation. It's not about rivalry. It's about reinforcement. Whatever affects one brother ought to affect all brothers. 
because we have a common enemy who is Satan and sin. Whenever I think about this, this matter of being a family and being brothers and sisters in Christ, I always, my mind always runs back to my mother and father. I told you about that when, uh, when the schools first integrated in, in 1969 and, and, and on. My daddy uh, take, took a nap every Saturday after work and every Sunday after church. And uh, Sunday after he ate and went to church, ate, came home, got ready to take his nap. Uh, when it's time for school to get started around September, my father would give us his September getting ready to go to school with white children's speech. Uh, he said, listen, if the children hit you, uh, you go tell the principal. Uh, you go tell the teacher. I don't want y'all fighting. I don't want y'all getting in no trouble. Uh, you go to school to learn your lesson. And if somebody push you down or somebody fights with you, you, you go tell the principal, you go to tell the teacher, and I don't want to hear that you're in no trouble fighting at school. And my mama was sitting at the table like this. <laughs> and she'd tell my daddy, you go to bed and sit down somewhere. She said, you let me hear one of y'all got in a fight, and all of y'all didn't get in the fight. You don't have to come home and fight with me. And I would rather be sewn in a bag with a wild animal and thrown in the Mississippi River than to fight with her. She said, one for all and all for one. That's the way we were raised, to love one another. My mother and father never let us argue and fight with one another because we were brothers and sisters. And if that's the way we got along at our house, that's the way we ought to get along at the church house. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. One for all and all for one. You are your brother's keeper. There ought not be division and strife among the fellowship because we are all brothers and sisters. That brings balance not only in your life but balance in the church. When it's not about you, when you can get your ego out of the way, it brings balance to your life. Psalm number one helps us right here. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Come on, you can help me say it. And in that law doth he meditate both day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's balance. That, that keeps you level. That keeps your life balanced. You never get out of balance if you become a son of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, brothers and sisters, Epaphroditus is a son who is balanced and that tells us something about his walk. But in the second place, Epaphroditus is a servant who is burdened and that tells us something about his work. He is a son who is balanced, which tells us something about his walk. He is a servant who is burdened, which tells us something about how he worked. Paul also calls him a companion in labor. In other words, he shouldered his portion of the load. Can I say that again? He shouldered his portion of the load. He didn't do like some of you did last Sunday. When I called for a special stewardship gift and you stayed home, uh, sick, uh, cold, and didn't come to church because you didn't want to shoulder your share of the load. See how quiet it got right there? Now, now, now the folk who were bearing the load, you could come on help me shout. Uh, but, but those who did not take any responsibility in sharing the load, I need to say to you that the church does not need money because it's God's ship and he knows how to keep it afloat. 
But the church needs people who will shoulder the load. Uh, I wish I had my 730 crowd. In verse number 25, he was a messenger and a minister. It's a shame, brothers and sisters. It is a shame that 80% of the work at the church is done by 20% of the membership. 80% of the work at the church is done by 20% of the membership. And the ones who are in the 80% are always complaining, I don't ever get a chance to lead a song. They use the same people over and over. There's some more people around here at the church. Well, we got to use who show up. If you don't show up, shut up. If you're not around when, when it's time for somebody to be used, we can't use you at your house. We can't use you at the Black Friday sale. We can't use you in New Orleans. We can't use you in Las Vegas. We can't lose, use you when you're not around. If you want to be used, show up. Yeah, I, I, figured, I figured it'd fall kind of flat right there. Brothers and sisters, there is plenty to do, but a shortage of people willing to do it. The harvest truly is plenteous. Ah, but the laborers are so few. So we ought to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send more laborers into the vineyard. I want you to look with me at the focus of the burden of Epaphroditus. The focus of Epaphroditus' burden was not himself, but his brothers and sisters at the church at Philippi. What a lesson for Lily Grove this morning. We are so caught up in what is happening with us that we are unable to see the needs of those around us. There is nothing more immature than a believer who thinks his or her own needs come first. There's nothing more immature than a believer who has to have his or her own way. Paul said when I was a child I wish I had a Bible reader. I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I understood like a child. But when I became a man when I grew up in my faith when I matured I put away childish things. Immature believers got to have it their way or they're going to tear it up. And if they don't get their way, they pick up their marbles and go join another church. But the problem with you joining another church is you joining another church. I wish I had time to unpack that right there. That church just got messed up when you joined because you take your disgruntled personality to another church and you cannot build a strong church with disgruntled members. Uh, hear me, brothers and sisters. The word full of heaviness in verse number 25, he was full of heaviness. That word needs investigation. He was burdened for his brothers and sisters, full of heaviness. That's the same word used for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was heavy. He began to be very heavy, burdened because of the sins of the world. And, and we need to get this morning a burden for brothers and sisters. You need to be burdened for lost people in your family. Burden over your lost co-workers. Burden over lost people in your neighborhood. We could fill up this church three times over if we got burdened for people who were lost. You ought to pray this morning that God put a burden on your heart that you ought not rest tonight until you tell somebody about Jesus. You ought not feel good going to sleep tonight Unless you know you have released your burden 
to share the good news of Jesus Christ. When they want to hear it and when they don't want to hear it because they need to hear the world is hungry for the living bread. We need to lift the Savior up for men to see. I was sharing with someone yesterday that a preacher that I greatly admire and respect uh, has kind of gotten off the rails because he was on some podcast or another uh, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the discussion was about uh, the book of Jude, verse number three, that talks about our common salvation. And they were discussing whether Jesus and the church and salvation is exclusive or inclusive. Is Jesus the only way? And he's a strong preacher. He's a, he's a great preacher. I admired him. I've preached at his church. He's preached in this church. But he said, uh, I don't know. He said, Jesus is my experience, but he may not be everybody else's experience. And I tried to call him nine times yesterday uh, to say, Reverend, are you losing your mind? Jesus is not one of the ways. He's the only way. Jesus is not a part of the truth. He is the truth. Jesus is not somebody you add to your life. Jesus is life itself. Stop letting the world make you be embarrassed to proclaim without apology on Christ. The solid rock I stand. All other ground. I wish I had somebody to help me this morning. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God under salvation. The late Dr. E.V. Hill the late Dr. E.V. Hill had an attorney Brother Abner had an attorney in his church who represented him in all of his legal matters represented Mount Zion in Los Angeles in all of their legal matters and um, he was a longtime member of Mount Zion. Pastor Hill uh, was his pastor and then he left the church and went and joined the Muslim movement. He became a Muslim and uh, Dr. Hill called him and uh, he said, I knew I was going to get a call from you. Uh, and he said, Reverend, I know you're going to fire me because I left the church and I became a Muslim. And E.V. Hill, in his inimitable fashion, said, no, I'm not firing you because you're a Muslim. You, you can believe whatever you want to believe. I'm not firing you because you left the church. You can be all the Muslim you want to be. He said, you're not my attorney any longer because you don't know the difference between stepping up and stepping down. And uh, anybody who ain't got sense enough to know the difference between stepping up and stepping down, if you don't know that leaving Christ to go to be a Muslim is stepping down, you can't represent me in traffic court. That's E.V. Hill talking. Brothers and sisters, you need to know the difference between stepping up and stepping down. Don't, don't let the Jehovah's Witnesses intimidate you. That's stepping down. Don't let the Seventh-day Adventists intimidate you. That's stepping down. Be ready always to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Stop talking about I don't argue the Bible. That's because you don't know the Bible. Study to show yourself approved. A workman that need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing. I wish I had a witness here. When you know the Bible, you can stand your ground. When you know the difference between stepping up and stepping down, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy, lean on Jesus' name. On Christ. I wish I had some noise here. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Uh, I, I, I'm going to try to call that boy again today. And say, Reverend, I think much learning has made you mad. You got a whole lot of knowledge, but you need some wisdom. 
That's, that's, that's what Priscilla and Aquila told Apollos. They said, you're smart. Uh, you, you, you're bright. You, you, you got the letter, but you need the spirit. Uh, you got a whole lot of learning, but you need some burning. You, you got a whole lot of reason, but you need some revelation. You got a whole lot of information, but you need some inspiration. I don't care what the academics and the intellectual says on Christ. The solid rock I stand. Now, brothers and sisters, you can call me ignorant. You can call me old-fashioned. You can call me traditional. But the B-I-B-L-E... That's the book for me. I wish I had time to bear down on it right there. I'm going to stay with Jesus. I believe that he was born in Bethlehem. I believe that he was baptized in the Jordan. I believe he healed the sick. I believe he raised the dead. I believe he turned water into wine. I believe he fed the multitude with two fish and five loaves of bread. I believe he raised Lazarus from the dead. I believe he touched that casket and that boy was raised from the dead whose mother was going to bury him. I believe he walked on water. I believe he calmed the stormy sea. I believe he died one Friday. I believe he rose one Sunday. I believe he's coming back again. The B-I-B-L-E... That's the book for me. Uh, that's, that's the focus of his burden. But I want you to see the fruit of his burden. You're going to really shout now. Here is the fruit of his burden. Look, look, look with me in verse 28 and verse 29. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. If you got a pen or a highlighter, I want you to highlight that word rejoice and the word gladness. Uh, when, when, when you see him, therefore, I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice. Underline that or highlight that word. And, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all, underline or highlight, gladness. When you see him, receive him with joy and gladness. When he comes to the church, when he comes to your house, when you see him on the street, Receive him with joy and gladness. How do people react when they see you coming? Do they cringe? Because they know you coming with a criticism? Do they dread seeing you? Because they know when they see you, they're going to hear an organ recital. Not, not, not the one over there. An organ recital. I'm having heart palpitation. My back, Lord, I, I, don't, I sure hope my kidney ain't acting up. My shoulder giving me the blues. Oh Lord, my knees hurt me so swole. I don't know, my sugar all up. Ooh, I'm kind of dizzy. Let me sit down. My, my pressure all up. Every organ in their body. <laughs> and when you see them, you try to go the other way and act like you didn't see them. But they catch you and you think you're getting out that door and they come and face you and say, I was trying to call you to tell you about my arthritis. Ooh, girl, I didn't sleep last night. 
Don't you just dread seeing them people coming? You hate to ask them how they're doing. Because, I mean, you, and sometimes you don't want to say how you're doing. You just say hello, and they say, you don't understand what I've been going through. I, I didn't ask you all that. I just said hello. Do you dread those kinds of people? Or do people avoid you? Because you are so negative. You don't have a good word to say about anything. Nothing pleases you. Nothing satisfies you. Something going on at the church, you say that was good, but they could have done it this way. That, that, that was nice, but I, I, wish, I wish they'd ask somebody else an opinion. You are so negative that people don't want to be around you. Do they receive you with joy and gladness, or do they say, oh, Lord. I wish I had somebody to help me. If you are a lovely, charming Christian, when people see you, their faces light up. Because they know that you come in with a word of encouragement and a word of blessing. It's a pleasure to be around people who are always encouraging. People who are always blessing instead of cursing. People who are always cheerful. People who are always lovely. People who are always charming. It's wonderful to be around a lovely Christian. What kind of Christian are you? Do people cringe when you come? Because you're so spiritual and you're so straight-laced that nobody can't cuss around you and they, they, they got to turn the TV off and nobody can't listen to no music riding with you because that's the devil's music. Negro, please. You ain't that spiritual. Because given the right set of circumstances, given the right drink, being in the right place with no lily grove folk around, somebody ought to help me preach here. The only reason I don't go to B.B. King concert and, and to Jay-Z and Beyonce's concert is because y'all going to be there. I would go, but I don't want to dance with none of y'all. Yes, I listen to the blues. Yes, I listen to the blues. I said, yes. Here it is, 3 o'clock in the morning. And I can't even close my eye. Black night is falling. Oh, how I hate to be all alone. I keep crying for my baby. And my baby's gone. I bought you a brand new Ford. You said I want a Cadillac. I bought you a $10 dinner. You said it was just a snack. I let you live in my penthouse. You said it was just a shack. I gave you seven children. Yeah, y'all know that. And now you want to give them back. I've been downhearted, woman. Stop acting like you're so spiritual and you can't be around sinners and you can't be. Jesus ate with publicans and sinners and prostitutes and drunkards and the common people heard him gladly. How do people act when you come around? He said, receive Epaphroditus with joy and gladness. As I heard it this morning, brothers and sisters, he was a brother who was balanced and that spoke of his work. He was a servant who was burdened and that spoke, uh, his walk was spoken of as a son. His burden speaks of him as his work. But now Epaphroditus is a soldier who is bold and his boldness speaks of Warfare. Paul also calls him not only a brother and a fellow servant, he calls him a fellow soldier. 
which means he fought alongside Paul and not against Paul. He fought alongside Paul and not against Paul. They were partners in a common struggle. They were shoulder to shoulder fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil. Are y'all listening to me? They were, on, they were as one in the dangers they faced, the enemies they encountered, and the goals that they shared. Lindy Grove, we need believers who are not afraid to put on the whole armor of God and to go with God in the battle. We, we don't sing any battle songs anymore at the church. We, we don't sing any more battle songs. When I was a boy, we used to sing Onward Christian Soldier, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. We, we don't sing those kind of songs anymore because we are not marching anywhere. We're not fighting anything, especially this young crowd. These young people, they are not for anything and they're not against anything. There, there is this universalism and pragmatism that has taken hold of the church that now we will do whatever works. We will do whatever pleases the largest number of people. I could fill this church to the rafters if I started some foolishness on Sunday morning. But if you show up here, you're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if any man will come after me, he must deny himself, take up a cross, and follow me. We are so busy trying to please thousands when we ought to really be concerned about pleasing just one. I wish I had some help to close here. We are trying to please the masses. We are trying to please thousands when our calling is just to please one. Because when it's all over, God is not going to ask me how many people did I preach to on Sunday morning. God will ask me, were you faithful to the gospel that you preach? Did you live the life that you were preaching about? Yeah, brothers and sisters, hear me this morning. Verse 30 indicates that Epaphroditus was sick unto death as a result of his labor in the work of the Lord. Ancient church tradition tells us that Epaphroditus was known for his work among the sick in Rome. Uh, he put everything on the line for Jesus Christ. Sadly, for many of us here at Lily Grove, we serve God when it's convenient. Our service hinges on convenience if our favorite show is not on or if some company don't show up or if we don't have something to do and, and we'll, we'll make all kind of excuses of why we can't be at church uh, and, 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 and these sports teams uh, put all of these activities cheerleader and, and, and basketball and football and all of that tournaments and all that is on Sunday. And, uh, and we will take our children out of youth ministry uh, to involve them in all of that kind of stuff and make excuses for it by saying, well, that's what he want to do. That's what I want to do too. But my daddy said, if the Lord gets you up Sunday morning, you going to church. I wish I had one or two more witnesses here. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he shall direct. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. What are you teaching your children by putting everything before God? Well, a better question is, who running your house? Oh, brothers and sisters, I, I didn't like it growing up. 
But I praise God I came up in a time when parents were not afraid of their children. Oh, oh. I, I can still hear my mama now saying, I'm the shack bully in this house. And I used to hate that word, shack bully. And I say to myself, I say to myself, shack bully. That's so ignorant. I'd never tell my children nothing crazy like that. I'm a shack. She ought to go sit down somewhere for a pop in her mouth. Shack bully. That's what I said to myself. And I find myself telling Victoria, I'm the shack bully in this house. Parents were not afraid of their children. They told you right from wrong. Now, you, you could go wrong, but they told you right. Have I got a witness here? And we ought to tell our children the blessings you enjoy right now. It hasn't always been that way. God's been good to us. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Listen to me, beloved. This, 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 this word, when the Bible says in verse number 30, not regarding his life, it was literally that he gambled his life. That's what that word literally means. He gambled his life. I told you earlier, I'm going to talk to you some more about this word gambling because Aphrodite was the Greek goddess of love and the Greek goddess, our patron saint in the Greek world of gambling. As a matter of fact, in ancient times, when people gambled threw dice on the floor, they would shout the name either Aphrodite or Epaphroditus. Throwing their dice on the floor, what they were saying was, I'm laying it all out there. I'm throwing it all out there. That's what Epaphroditus means. It speaks of voluntarily disregarding your own welfare and exposing yourself even to death. It means I'm taking a chance on Jesus and I'm rolling the dice. And if Jesus don't come through, I'm through. Yeah. Epaphroditus was willing to gamble his life for the cause of Christ. Do you want to know what Lily Grove Missionary Baptist Church really needs? I told you a moment ago, we don't need money. So you could have came to church last Sunday. We don't need money because this is the Lordship and he knows how to keep it afloat. We don't need prestige because I don't care what you do for poor folk in the community, they're going to talk about the church no matter what. We don't need political influence because when Bato O'Rourke was running, they called and wanted to come here to the church and then they found out it wasn't going to be no talking and all of a sudden he had an emergency in Austin. And Sheila Jackson Lee and John Lewis and, and Al Green, they ran all over town to every church around Lily Grove, but they didn't come here because we don't need political influence. This is a word church. This is the church that preaching and the gospel built. This church was not built on political influence. And we don't do our best work in the political arena because in politics, there is no inherent ability to cleanse itself. And so anybody who gets caught up in it gets tainted by it. And so they drive by here and go on to every church they can get a, a, a hearing in. Because I've said to them more than one time, until you let me preach in Congress, you're not going to speak at Lily Grove. I'm firm, I'm convicted that the gospel of Jesus Christ, and listen, no politician ought to be able to have more influence here than me. Because I get voted in every Sunday by your attendance in worship. And who we serve is not up for re-election. Our God is an awesome God and we don't need money, influence, or political persuasion on Christ. The solid rock I stand 
all of the ground is sinking sand. Brothers and sisters, what Lily Grove Church needs is people who will commit themselves to be like Epaphroditus, who will put everything on the line for Jesus Christ, who will throw it all out there on the floor, who will, who will gamble it all, throw it all out there, and call that name. Don't call the name Aphrodite. When you throw it out there, don't call the name Epaphroditus. But when you throw it out there, call the name Jesus. And brothers and sisters, listen to me. Uh, when you gamble on the slots, you may or may not win. When you gamble at the roulette table, you may or may not get red or black. If you gamble at the crap table, your card may not turn out right. If you gamble at Texas poker, you may win or may not win, but I dare you to throw your chips in with Jesus Christ. And when you throw it all in with God, when you make up your mind you are going to throw it all out there, God will let you win every time. I'm through now. But I want to talk to some winners in here this morning. I need to talk to somebody here who's more than a conqueror. Through him that loved you. You're going to help me close this, won't you? I need to talk to somebody here who didn't know how your stuff was going to turn out. But you just gambled it all on Jesus. And he turned the battle in your favor. I need somebody here who's all alone. You're the only one left in your family but you're still throwing it all on the table for Jesus Christ. And the Lord's still waking you up every morning, still putting you to bed every night, still making a way out of no way. I need somebody here who's retired and the Lord's still taking care of you. You can help me testify. I've been young, but now I'm old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. I need somebody here who's been down to your last dime and your back was almost against the wall but God provided enough space between your back and the wall that you can testify can't nobody do me like Jesus. I need somebody here who's thrown all your chips in for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord if you don't come through I don't know how I'm going to make it. So I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what the world says. No matter what the academics and the intellectuals are talking about. No matter what my friend is talking about saying Jesus may not be the only way to God. I'm going to stand on the solid promises of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. I wish I had one or two more witnesses here. I'm glad this morning that I let nothing separate me from the love of God. Height nor depth, angels nor principalities, things present nor things to come. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Let people laugh at you because you shout on Sunday. Let people talk about you because you come to church too much. Let people ridicule you because you're throwing it all in for Jesus Christ. Somebody here ought to help me testify there's nothing so precious as Jesus to me. Let earth with its treasures be gone. I'm rich as can be with my Savior I see. I'm happy with Jesus alone. Is there anybody here happy with Jesus alone? I said, is there anybody here not ashamed to call on that name? If the Lord opened doors for you, you ought to throw it all in this morning. If the Lord made a way for you, you ought to throw it all in this morning. If the Lord pick you up, turn you around, place your feet 
on solid ground. Throw it all in this morning. Don't keep nothing back. Don't keep any of your praise back. Don't keep any of your shout back. Shout like the Lord's been good to you. Praise him like he's opened doors for you. Give him glory like he made a way for you. Holler like the Lord's been good to you. Why don't you grab somebody, shake somebody's hand, tell them, I don't know what you come to do, but I've come to praise his name because he brought me from a mighty long way. He died, didn't he die? But brighter early, brighter early, Sunday morning, he got up. I know he's all right. It's coming Tuesday. I've been preaching 41 years and I wouldn't take nothing from my journey now. You can't make me doubt him. I know too much about him. Has he been good to you? Has he made a way for you? Then come on, help me lift him up. Come on, help me magnify his name. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy, I know he's all right. I understand. I understand what Job meant. When Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. All the days of my appointed time, I'm wait until my change come. And my grandmother used to say, he may not come when you want it. Somebody ought to help me testify. He's always on time. Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. Nor has it even entered the hearts of men. The good things that God has in store for them that love him. I'm persuaded. That he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him until that day.